Hi, Jerry Doyle here, Doyle Audio Engineering. Today I'm going to talk to you about a crossover. What is a crossover? How does it work? Why do we need it in a PA system? So I'm trying to do this as quickly as possible. Um, and I'll start off with here, we've got a woofer and a tweeter. This speaker happens to be a Fatal, I believe one of the best speakers in the world. Uh, this cone, is, if you can imagine, has to move really, really quickly to reproduce sound waves of lower frequencies. Now, because it's so heavy and it can't move very, very quickly, it's not ideal for trying to hear or reproduce the higher frequencies. So, above 2 to 3K is where we want to at least use a diaphragm. Okay, and in some cases, the ideal spot for a two-way uh, system like this is to probably cross over about 1,200 hertz. Now, here we've got high frequency unit in here, a compression driver, small little diaphragm in the bottom, a uh, nice light diaphragm, it moves very, very quickly, so there's uh, how we're able to get the high frequencies from movement of this. Obviously, if we try and put low frequencies into a small little diaphragm, it's not going to be able to excurt or move as much to get the low notes out of this horn. Vice versa, if you've got a cone like this, it's going to be too heavy, it's not going to work fast enough to get the high frequencies out of the woofer. So what we have to do is divide the frequency range. We can hear as people from approximately 20 hertz to 20k, and uh, depending on, on who you are and how old you are, <laughs> that frequency range shrinks a little bit. Um, but essentially what we want to be able to do is divide the frequencies, and this is two ways to do it. One is using what we call a passive crossover. Now the passive crossover comes after the amplifier and the passive crossover is in the speaker box itself. Okay, and here I've got an example, well frankly a bad example of, of uh, a passive crossover. I won't say who the manufacturer is, but these ones happen to blow up. Uh, again, these are actually one of the, you know, probably is a good example to show you one of the deficiencies of using a passive crossover inside the box. When you've got a lot of power going through this system, as it heats up, as these inner parts with the higher power going through it heats up, it changes the crossover point, uh, and in this case, it literally has blown the part up. Uh, what we try to do uh, when we're building a passive crossover for a system is we'll simply use bigger coils, bigger caps, uh, bigger resistors. Uh, here there's one resistor here. Where they have one here in our systems, we would use eight. Now the problem with that, more parts cost more money, uh, the general public is kind of getting used to the idea of believing you can buy something really, really cheap. In the long run, when you buy something cheap, you are going to pay for it one way or the other. Here's a good example of a brand name product that simply has parts that aren't going to last. But there you have it. This is a passively done. What happens is the frequency comes through here. The capacitors keep the low frequencies out of the tweeter and the coils keep the high frequencies out of the woofer. And there's a number of different ways to where you uh, uh, arrange and do the circuit as to how it works. That's not really important. All you need to know is this is a passive crossover. Um, again, disadvantage, it absorbs a lot of the energy coming out of the amplifier and it's lost in there. And unless it's really good, high quality, expensive parts, uh, it's gonna change the frequency point and cause a lot of problems. The ideal way to do it is with an active crossover. Now here we've got an active crossover to where full range goes into this from your processing and mixing board. And you have a full frequency from 20 Hz to 20K coming in. And then this will divide the low frequencies and you'll actually be able to control how much volume goes to your low frequency. And then you can select your crossover point as where it sounds nicest and then you've got the volume control of your high frequencies. And this is a new, really nice, simple, analog design rain uh, crossover. Uh, by the way, this unit, I believe, is about 23 years old, and I'm still using it. Uh, it pays to make a wise investment into the things that you buy. Rain, great product, absolutely great product, love it. And uh, this is really uh, a really good example of why it's worthwhile to spend a few dollars more on good quality product. Now I'm going to show you um, a combination of when you can use a passive crossover and an active crossover 
you get basically the best of both worlds. In the passive crossover, when you are putting in a high frequency, uh, in, and the higher the frequency going into your passive crossover, actually the easier it is for that passive crossover to handle that higher frequency. So you don't have to put as expensive a unit into that particular crossover in terms of the parts involved, and you can do it affordably and reasonably. In this box here, we have what's called a three-way. Now we've got our woofer, and our mid-range, and our high frequency. This to me is, is ultimately the best way to have any kind of a PA. Uh, professionally speaking, in all pro audio rock concerts, etc., it's always at least a three-way, sometimes a four-way system. But if I can get all of my mid-range fundamental notes, my vocal range, into one unit, I believe I'm going to have a much better sounding system in my mid-range. I'm going to have all of my vocals coming through the mid-range and it's going to sound a lot nicer. However, if I'm using an active crossover, what happens is I've got to go, the low frequencies go to one side of the amplifier, the high frequencies go to the other side of the amplifier. So it's taking up a little bit more uh, power, uh, it's taking up more sides of an amplifier. It's a little more costly to go this way. Now, if I wanted to go three-way, then I would need a third side of an amplifier to go three-way. But what I can do is I can design and build a really nice passive crossover as what we have here between the mid-range and the high frequency. It's crossed over at approximately 2700 hertz. So that works out really well. I can use higher quality parts so I don't deal with a lot of the negative things uh, such as power absorption uh, through the passive crossover. And down here I'm crossing over approximately 400 hertz down into the woofer. What's critical about this is I couldn't do this properly with a passive crossover because quite simply the coils <laughs> that I would need and all the parts that I would need would be two to three hundred dollars in parts alone to cross over what we believe should be done and how it should be done between uh, this mid-range and woofer. So to cross this over actively works out really, really great for us. So we've got the best of both worlds, using a passive crossover and an active crossover. And having a three-way box to where all the fundamental mid-range vocal range is coming through the mid. So that's essentially it. That's how uh, the difference between different crossovers, how they work, the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I should point out, you know, going with an active crossover, it does mean you've, you've got to use more sides of an amplifier. Uh, but ultimately, uh, at, at the end of the day, you're going to get a much better sound. Uh, sometimes you've got to budget the system that you're putting together that maybe you won't be able to run stereo because otherwise, if you wanted to go two-way and divide it up, you'd need two amplifiers instead of using one. Uh, this system, as an example, can still get away with using just one amplifier, but you'd have to run it in mono. In other words, you could put your mid-range and high-frequency together and in parallel with another cabinet that's on the other side of the stage and you have just one signal going into that uh, side of the amplifier and then you have your low frequencies with one side, the other side of your amplifier going into the woofer. So you can get away with going mono and still using one amplifier and then dividing all of this properly so that all the components are working at their best and most efficient. So that's it. Uh, Jared Doyle here. If you've got any questions, uh, please feel free to leave them in the comment box. Um, if you like and uh, this has been helpful to you, please subscribe to our channel. And hopefully I'll be coming up with some more pro tips that will help you uh, understand uh, the fun and fundamentals in uh, music and in speaker cabinets and sound systems. All the best for now. Take care.